Throughout history, we occasionally come across those who attract mystery and intrigue. These figures become larger than life and remain inscrutable enigmas. One of those figures is the mystifying woman known as Nina Kulagina. Nina was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1926. As a young and impressionable 14-year-old, Nina enlisted herself in the Red Army. She was assigned to a tank regiment fighting the Nazis during World War II. This was a grim, dark chapter in her life. During this time, Nina endured the numerous hardships of war and violence before an injury ended her military career. After the end of her time in the military, Nina led a seemingly normal life, on paper at least. She went on to get married, settle down, and have children. She was, for all intents and purposes, a housewife. It was during this quiet time in her life that things would begin to get very strange. Nina found herself delving into the ancient archives of legendary cases of powerful psychic individuals. Nina describes the night she realized that something wasn't quite right. I was very angry and upset one day. I was walking toward a cupboard in my apartment when suddenly a pitcher in the cupboard moved to the edge of the shelf, fell, and smashed to bits. At first she was frightened a bit and suspected that her home might even be haunted. Over time, she began to realize the link between her anger and the phenomena was undeniable. Nina had had hazy recollections of her own mother possessing the ability to move things with her mind. Perplexed, she tried to focus her concentration. Initially, she wasn't able to control what appeared to be psychokinesis, or the ability to move objects with the power of the mind alone. It took a lot of practice and patience. Over time, she slowly gained the ability to move objects at will, starting with small, light objects, such as strips of paper, cigarettes, and matchsticks, gradually graduating to heavier, more substantial objects, much to her own amazement. Nina's powers grew outside of just inanimate objects, as she allegedly started to manifest other abilities. She discovered she could see what was inside people's pockets, see colors with her eyes closed merely by touching something, and even, by her own accounts, healing people or generating electromagnetic energy from her body. Nina was no ordinary housewife. She mostly kept these extraordinary powers to herself for fear of telling anyone else. After suffering mental problems, she was sent to a hospital for observation. The hospital staff saw firsthand her miraculous and mysterious abilities, previously unknown to anyone. This is when word got out about her, attracting interest from parapsychologists around Russia. One of the first to come and test Nina's abilities was Soviet scientist Edward Naumov, who quickly affirmed her potent psychokinetic abilities. To test them, he spread out some matches in front of her in an impromptu experiment. Nina quickly demonstrated her abilities, moving them with her mind to the edge of the table and onto the floor. After this, she was supposedly intensely studied by Soviet scientists in numerous experiments under controlled conditions. During this process, the extent of her abilities became abundantly clear and undeniable. One of the most widely tested of Nina's powers was that of psychokinesis. She was consistently able to baffle everyone fortunate enough to witness these demonstrations, purportedly even under the strictest of lab conditions. Among the many experiments carried out, some truly stand out as bizarre. In one test, Nina was able to move objects that were completely sealed in a plexiglass container, 
and to even remove a marked matchstick from a pile under these conditions. In another, she made a ping pong ball levitate for several seconds. Perhaps the most spectacular one was when she was seated in front of a vat of saline solution in which hovered an egg, floating there like an insect in amber. Nina was confirmed to have no way to physically reach it or affect it with any sort of trickery. And with some amount of intense concentration, she was able to allegedly open the egg and separate the yolk from the white, all while puzzled scientists looked on. She was even able to put the two halves back together, though only if she kept her focus long enough. Many of the experiments conducted with Nina Kulagina were documented on film, this one included. These displays of psychokinesis had profound and measurable effects on Kulagina's heartbeat, brain waves, and electromagnetic field. They also caused her discomfort and drained her both mentally and physically. They even caused dramatic weight loss over a short period of time, yet she was always willing to continue these experiments. Other powers were also supposedly uncovered and tested by scientists, such as the ability to develop film that was kept in an envelope with her mind, to tell what color any object was without being able to see it, to magnetize or demagnetize objects and to cause images to appear on paper. All of these were revealed over time, with perhaps most impressive of them being her ability to seemingly affect organic tissue and living cells. It was this power that lies at the center of one of her most famous and certainly weirdest experiments of her career. The experiment was organized by Soviet scientist Dr. Gennady Sergeyev, who had spent years studying the mysterious woman and running her through countless tests in the experiment, the still beating heart of a frog was placed in a solution, which could keep it beating for up to an hour. Kulagina was asked to see if she could influence it in any way with her mind. Scientists were measuring beats per minute through electrodes they'd hooked up to the amphibian's tiny ticker. According to the Soviet doctors monitoring her, Kulagina's own heart rate increased dramatically during the seven minutes it took her to mentally stop the frog's heart. It had taken her 20 minutes to prepare for the exercise. Later, rumors would even claim she could influence human hearts. However, this is unconfirmed. As to how she did it, Sergeyev would speculate that she somehow was drawing energy in from the atmosphere around her and projecting it at the thing she was focusing on. He made electromagnetic readings that he claimed supported this theory. All of these amazing feats were starting to get out into the wild and into international news. It wasn't long before Nina Kulagina was attracting scientists from overseas. In the meantime, Nina changed her name to Nelia Mikhailova in order to hide and protect her real identity, as she was facing increased scrutiny from the public. Despite this scrutiny, throughout it all, she was said to be labeled the real deal by nearly everyone who studied her. Of course, there were skeptics who waved it all away as illusions, sleight of hand and trickery, but these experiments were consistently claimed to be under the most stringent conditions. Regardless of accusations of cheating, it has never been conclusively proven that she was ever caught doing so in any of these bizarre demonstrations. In fact, in one instance, she was accused of fraud by a Soviet newspaper. Kulagina won a defamation case against her, further propelling her legend. The main problem with all of this is that it is almost based solely on reports coming out of the Soviet Union, 
at the time when the Cold War was going on. Most notably, there was much competition between the United States on many playing fields. Importantly, both governments were engaged in their own studies into psychic phenomena at the time. So there seems to be the definite possibility that the stories of Kulajina's powers were at best exaggerated or at worst completely fabricated. In the end, there is simply no way to truly verify any of it. All sources lead back to Soviet claims, often with murky details on how these supposed strict environments were carried out. We have no choice but to take their word for it. There is also the fact, despite the Soviets claiming that dozens of scientists examined her, including two Nobel laureates no less, there doesn't seem to have been any official scientific paper ever published on it at all. This seems particularly odd for such a sensational, potentially groundbreaking subject. Then there is the fact that the videos of her supposed demonstrations are grainy and indistinct, making it difficult to count them as hard evidence. Although Nina Kulagina was without a doubt a real person, there is no tangible way to untangle the fact from possible fiction. And we have no way to really know whether she was a scam artist or one of the most powerful psychics ever. We just don't know. Whether Kulagina was the real deal or not, she stood by her claims for the rest of her life. It has been said that her use of her alleged abilities may have led to her demise. Her supposed psychic abilities were said to be well documented as taking a serious toll on her physical health, even causing a severe heart attack at one point in the 1970s, which almost killed her. Over the years, she continued various demonstrations and experiments, but she was often described as looking increasingly haggard and frail. In 1990, she finally passed away at the age of 64 taking whatever secrets she had to the grave with her. So was this all Soviet trickery, the work of a charlatan, or evidence of an enormously powerful psychic lost to history? No matter what one thinks, Nina Kulagina has certainly cemented herself as a true paranormal historical oddity and a mysterious case that has never really been solved. This is the story of a remarkable man. When faced with the terrible choice of burning to death or falling to his death, this man chose the latter. Our bodies continue to wow us with their resilience and ability to withstand intense physical trauma. We exist inside this seemingly delicate but incredible machine. Every day we are bombarded by stories that tell us just how focused and intelligent our body is, even when the brain is incapacitated. Is it luck, circumstance, a higher being, or simply a matter of science that keeps us alive through seemingly impossible conditions? In 1944, the world was engaged in the greatest war mankind had ever seen. It was raging in Europe, ravaging that area of the continent. There were massive quantities of airplanes firing red-hot shots at one another in catastrophic air battles, men finding themselves facing extremely dangerous circumstances, although perhaps not as dangerous as one man thought. Nicholas Stephen Alchemade was born on December 10, 1922, in North Walsham, Norfolk, and became a market gardener in Lowborough before the outbreak of war. When World War II broke out, he left his gardening post to take up arms in the war. He trained as an air gunner and was posted to the 115th Squadron as a rear gunner on their Avro Lancasters. After successfully completing 14 operations, Alchemate's crew were detailed to raid Berlin on the night of March 24, 
1945. Alchemade's six-man crew plane, nicknamed Werewolf, was one of 811 planes ordered to attack the German capital that night. Werewolf and the crew carried out the mission, which went without incident. On their way back to safety, the crew encountered strong winds that blew them southward, toward the Ruhr, where there was a large number of anti-aircraft defenses. Despite 14 successful missions, all without issue, luck was not on their side that night. Right around midnight, the crew and aircraft were attacked by German Junkers fighter. The bomber's wing and fuselage raised by machine gun fire and immediately burst into flames. Alchemade, as the rear gunner, attempted to defend the men by shooting back. Unfortunately, the windows of his turret had been blown out. The fire was starting to engulf the entire rear of the plane. The order came from Werewolf's pilot, James Newman, to abandon the crippled bomber. He knew they were done for, and the plane was going down. He gave the order to take their parachutes and jump to safety. Alchemade was not wearing his parachute, since the gunner's area was too cramped for it to be worn all the time. So Alchemade opened the door that separated him from the rear of the plane to access the storage locker that held his parachute. It was then he began to realize how much trouble he was in. The entire back of the plane was on fire, and to his dismay, so was his parachute. The heat was intense and rapidly consuming the aircraft. Almost immediately, his oxygen mask began to melt, and he felt his hands becoming engulfed in flames. He shut the door, but the raging fire began to burn hotter. Nicholas Alchemade was out of options. As he recounted later, I had the choice of staying with the aircraft or jumping out. If I stayed, I would be burned to death. My clothes were already well alit and my face and my hands burnt, though at the time I scarcely noticed the pain owing to my high state of excitement. I decided to jump and end it all as quick and clean as I could. I rotated the turret to starboard and, not even bothering to take off my helmet and intercom, did a backflip out into the night. It was very quiet, the only sound being the drumming of aircraft engines in the distance, and no sensation of falling at all. I felt suspended in space. Regrets at not getting home were my chief thoughts, and I did think once that it didn't seem very strange to be going to die in a few seconds. None of the parade of my past or anything like that. So out he went, headed from 18,000 feet above the earth to the ground at 120 miles per hour. The werewolf exploded above him, and while he plummeted toward the ground, he lost consciousness during the descent, which would have been the end of this story. Except three hours later, Alchemade, now safely lying on the ground, opened his eyes. He was lying on his back on a pile of snow and could see the stars above him through the canopy of some pine trees. Slowly and gingerly, Alchemade moved his arms and legs. Remarkably, he seemed unhurt. It seemed that the flexible young pines had slowed his descent, enough that the snow was able to cushion his fall. When he landed in a pile of snow beneath, the impact hadn't been too hard. He had not broken one bone, but had only managed to sprain his knee after an 18,000-foot fall from the sky. The first thing he did was to smoke a cigarette and reflect on his good fortune. When he finally stood up, he realized he had sprained his knee and that at some point his boots had come off, presumably in the trees above. Just 20 yards from where he had landed was a wide open area, devoid of snow. If he had landed there, he would have died. 
Despite being safe and relatively unharmed, Alchemy couldn't walk due to his injured leg. He discarded his unused parachute harness and blew his distress whistle. Soon, some local Germans found him, and he ended up in a hospital where his burns, cuts, and sprain were looked after. He had survived and was remarkably unscathed. Then, the Gestapo arrived. By all rights, Alchemade was a prisoner of war. This would have seen him sent to prison camp. However, when the Gestapo interrogated him, they asked where his parachute was. He told them he didn't have one, that he had jumped from the plane and been simply lucky. Understandably, the Gestapo didn't believe him. They accused him of burying the parachute and being a spy. If they proved this to be true, it would mean a death sentence for Alchemaid. The interrogators kept at it, finding it hard to believe that someone could survive what Alchemaid claimed. Nonetheless, he stuck to his story. A search of where he was found led to the Germans finding his discarded harness, which had clearly not been used. To further corroborate his story, the wreckage of the werewolf was found 20 miles away. In the shredded and burned remains of the aircraft, the Gestapo found Alchemade's parachute, with the ripcord and cable still wrapped up tight in the container. Finally, they were convinced. He skirted death twice to now become a prisoner of war. The Germans were impressed and even gave him a commemorative certificate that stated Alchemade had indeed fallen 18,000 feet without a parachute and survived. He was sent to Stalag Luft III POW camp in Poland. Nicholas Alchemade's story gave him celebrity status. He received extra cigarette rations, and another prisoner, Flight Lieutenant Bennett Kenyon, even drew a portrait of him. The war was coming to an end, and the Russians were advancing. To keep prisoners of war away from the Russians, which would have led to the prisoners being liberated, Tens of thousands of POWs, including Alchemade, were forced to march west. They faced blizzards, exhaustion, and starvation. Tragically, hundreds died before they were eventually freed and the war came to a close. Alchemade had survived. He danced on the edges of death more times than most, if not all, human beings do in their lifetimes. After the war, Nicholas Stephen Alchemade moved to Lowborough with his wife and children. He lived a good life and passed away in 1987. So was it luck? What are these forces that seem to guide our lives so much? How can one man die from the height of 30 feet, while another lives after falling from over 18,000 feet without a parachute? The debate has raged on since Alchemade first stood up after his famous fall, fueled by each variable, no matter how small it seems. Everything from the depth of the snow to the type of the pine tree he fell into has been scrutinized. And the only ultimate conclusion we can come to is that his survival is simply unexplainable. History has told us a great many tales of unexplained possessions. These tales are the whispers of religions, of the old or the fearful. They vary by region, by demon, and most of them are unsolved, untouched, or even kept secret. Those curious enough to dig in further have been cautioned, been told to tread lightly into this world of paranormal phenomena. Many have turned away urging only those brave enough to go forth and face what they call the curse of the exorcism. Exorcism, from the Greek eschorismos, binding by oath, is the religious or spiritual practice of evicting demons or other spiritual entities from a person or an area that is believed to be possessed. As citizens of the world, we go back and forth on what is truth and what is fiction. 
Is it true that a demon can bewitch and control the human body? So much so that the bewitched body can lose all authority and be victim to unpredictable actions and harsh words. Or is this simply an undiagnosed psychological disorder, as science tells us it must be? Experts in exorcism, preachers, religious leaders, historians, believe that the possessed persons are the victims, not the perpetrators of evil doings. They are not regarded as evil in themselves, nor wholly responsible for their actions. Because of this, those that specialize in performing the exorcisms, which is the act of expelling a demon or evil spirit from the body, regard exorcism as more of a cure than a punishment. For some of the possessed, exorcism has the cure that's brought the person back into their own body again. Unfortunately, some victims of demonic possession don't survive this cure. Some never again return to their body and die. Annalise Michel grew up devoutly Catholic in Bavaria, West Germany in the 1960s, where she attended mass twice a week. When she was 16 years old, she suddenly blacked out at school and began walking around dazed. Though Annalise did not remember the event, her friends and family said she was in a trance-like state. Eight years later, on July 1, 1976, 23-year-old Annalise Michel died after almost nine months of exorcism. She spent eight years seeking help for her shaking and trance-like states to no real avail. A year after the original incident, she experienced another one, this time in her sleep. She was finally diagnosed with grand mal epilepsy. After her diagnosis, she changed a lot and spent more of her time depressed. After a long stay at the hospital and receiving medical care for her new condition, Annalise thought that everything would be back to normal, but it wasn't. She began to see things out of the ordinary, out of her own reality, starting with devilish grimaces across people's faces during her daily prayers. She called them devil faces. It's at that point in time that she was believed to be possessed. She continued to take these hallucinations to her medical professionals, but received nothing to make them go away. She was unable to find any reason and explanation why she was seeing the devil faces. Things only got worse from there. As the days passed, she began to hear voices following her, telling her she would rot in hell. She sunk deeper into her depression. She felt hopeless, alone. Doctors found seemingly no reason for what was happening. They couldn't help her condition at all. She was initially hesitant to open up to doctors about these demons, afraid they wouldn't believe her. And one time, she did tell a doctor about the demons. They reacted as much as she expected. Desperate for help for Annalise, her parents finally noticed that perhaps Annalise needed a different kind of help, one that existed outside the medical community. They feared their daughter might be possessed. They sought aid from many pastors in the community, begging for an exorcism. Unfortunately, all of the Catholic chaplains rejected them and recommended they continue the medication for the proof of a possession. Possession, or infestatio, as they sometimes called it, is strictly structured. There are set criteria to fulfill before any bishop can approve an exorcism. Pastor Ernst Alt, supervising Annalise at that time, asked the Bishop of Würzburg for the permit to perform an exorcism on Annalise Michel in 1974. His request was also rejected, so he recommended Annalise abide by an even more religious lifestyle. According to an article in ComingSoon.net, the attacks did not disappear and she became more terrible at her parents' house in Klingenberg. She often insulted, beat, and bit the family members. 
She didn't eat because the demons didn't allow her to. Annalise slept at the stone floor, ate spiders, flies, and coal. After an exact verification in September 1975, Joseph Stangl, the Bishop of Warsburg, assigned Father Arnold Rentz and Pastor Ernst Alt with the order to perform the great exorcism on Annalise Michel. The basis for this ritual is the Ritual Romanum, a still valid canon law from the 17th century. Pastor Alt and Father Rentz tried to save Annalise from over six individuals, Lucifer, Judas Iscariot, Nero, Cain, Hitler, and Fleischmann. From September 75 till July 76, they held one to two sessions a week. Her attacks were so strong that she sometimes had to be held down by three men, or even worse, they would have to chain her up. Between those sessions in her parents' house, Annalise went some time without any attacks, at which she was able to go to school and take her final examinations at the Pedagogic Academy in Warsburg. She even went to church. She experienced some semblance of normalcy, like it was before. The exorcism continues over weeks and months, always praying the same specified prayers and incantations over and over again. As expected, the ritual was thought to be working, but the attacks didn't stop. The young woman grows unconscious and paralyzed more often. Sometimes her parents are present, or her sisters, even a married couple that claims of having discovered Annalise. Over several weeks, she denies every food. Her knees are burst because of the 600 genuflections she does obsessively during the exorcisms. During the course of the exorcism, they logged over 400 audio tapes to document their findings. The last day of the exorcism rite was June 30th, 1976. Annalise can't waive doing the genuflections because she is now suffering from pneumonia, totally emaciated, and has a high temperature. Her parents even help her do them. Beg for absolution is the last sentence Annalise says to the exorcist. To her mother, she says, Mother, I'm afraid. Anna Michelle recorded the death of her daughter the very next day, July 1st, 1976. At noon, Pastor Ernst Alt informs the prosecuting authorities in Afschaffensburg. The senior prosecutor began investigating immediately. There were only two questions to answer. What caused the death of Annalise Michelle and who was responsible? The cause of death as diagnosed by forensics, Annalise starved to death. If the accused would have begun force feeding one week before her death, Annalise could have been saved. Her sister told the courts that Annalise didn't want to go to a mental house or nor be sedated and forced to eat. The exorcist tried to prove the presence of demons by playing the over 40 tapes they recorded. There were such strange dialogues, like two of the demons arguing, each arguing over who of them has to leave Annalise's body first. A commission of the German Bishop Conference later declared that Annalise Michel was not possessed. Annalise's parents and the chaplains were all found guilty of manslaughter and the omission of first aid. The judgment was not as harsh as expected. All of the accused were sentenced to six months of probation. You're walking as you breathe in the fresh air of the fields surrounding you. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, and the sky is as blue as the ocean. You lean back to sit down, but instead of being softly greeted by the grass of the meadow, you realize that you're falling. You panic, 
trying to reach for something, but around you, there is nothing. Just as you feel as you're going to hit the ground, you wake up. You're panting, dripping with sweat. It was just a dream, you think, as you release the tension and lean back in your bed. Decoding the mystery of dreams is not a mark of the modern day, but a practice of thousands of years old from both scientists and people alike. As humans, we are continually questioning the meaning behind our dreams. Why do some people have more dreams than others? What do dreams about the future mean? And why do they sometimes come true? The science of dreams varies across the globe. Each society's predominant understanding of the dream world depends upon the culture and the history of each part of the world. Each place has different legends about the nature and origins of dreams. Ancient Greeks and Romans believed that dreams provided messages from the gods. The Chinese believed that dreams were a message from our dead ancestors, and many Native American tribes as well as Mexican civilizations believed dreams were a different world we visit when we sleep, a parallel universe. Building on the understanding of dreams from Native Americans, we examine the question, even the possibility that some of our dreams may actually be a form of reality happening in a parallel universe. Right then and there, is it possible that some of our dreams are, in fact, glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality? As humans, we are programmed to dream. The word dream comes from an old word in English that means joy and music. The average human has approximately six to 10 dreams each night. A majority of these dreams take place during the REM portion of our sleep cycle. Despite having such active minds while at rest, traveling to new places or revisiting old ones, our dreams are usually forgotten mere minutes after we wake up. However, what if there's an actual meaning to dreams that would make them more lucrative to remember? Have you ever experienced a dream that was so real and lifelike that you felt you were literally there in the moment? A dream that was, for that moment, reality. A warm breeze on your face, the smell of vast ocean right in front of you, the taste of salt left on your lips after a swim, warm sand squishing beneath your feet. These realistic dreams feel much more than just the creation of our imagination. A new science-based theory might actually reveal this to be true. Scientists of today have found themselves agreeing with Native American tribes and Mexican nations in their belief that we, well namely our brains, visit a parallel universe when we dream. This would explain why humans can dream in color and can utilize all five senses to feel what's happening within the dream. The theory of a parallel universe all starts with the existence of a multiverse. The idea that our universe isn't the only one out there. In fact, it is just one of many. Within each of these universes is a new reality. It's one that may closely resemble our own, but is altered in some way by the decisions that we've made. This is a concept that scientists have entertained and explored for many years, even though it can be slightly controversial belief within the scientific community. For a moment, consider the last major decision you made in your life. Perhaps you moved to a new city for your dream job. In one of these parallel universes, another version of you may exist 
that chose differently, choosing instead to stay in the city you know and turn down the job. This one change in your narrative creates a ripple effect, changing every area of your life from that moment on. If you have ever dreamt of your life, but it appeared to you as a lightly altered or skewed version of reality, maybe your home was different or your town had changed. Maybe you had a different career or even a different partner. What may have actually happened in that moment was a glimpse at your life inside a parallel universe. The dream itself feels so real, as if you're actually standing there, because it is in fact real, just in an alternate universe. This is the life that the alternate you has created. People often have a recurring dream about a place they never visited or never even heard of. It's possible that such dreams are glimpses into what one experienced in a parallel universe. Sometimes people dream about events that have not yet happened, but will take place in the future. Such dreams could also be incoming images from an alternate world where you are living a different life. Who knows? Perhaps some of our most special dreams are a window into a parallel universe. This is, of course, pure speculation, but without speculation and scientific curiosity, we will never be able to learn more about the secrets of the universe and our reality. So, can some of our dreams be glimpses of events taking place in an alternate reality, a parallel universe? This begs the question, one that scientists and many others contemplate. If our dreams are, in fact, a glimpse into an alternate life, can we use them to explore these worlds? Are we no longer limited to just our universe? We only know one thing for sure. Much further study is required, but this just may be the start of some incredible discoveries in the future. There are tons of mysterious places around the world, both on land and in water, that are difficult to explain logically. The legends of missing vessels and ghost ships drifting without its crew in these locations have made them synonyms to the mystery. Though the notorious Bermuda Triangle tops the list of most mysterious places on this planet, a number of other locations also remain mysterious, as much as the former. The Devil's Sea, also known as the Dragon's Triangle, is one of such sailors' nightmares in the waters around the world. The Dragon's Triangle is an area of Japan that bears a resemblance to the phenomena of the Bermuda Triangle. For centuries, Japanese fishermen have been lost to the waters of Manumi, the Devil's Sea. More recently, scores of modern ships and aircrafts have inexplicably fallen victim to these unforgiving waters too, some disappearing without a trace. Sailors have reported countless numbers of fishing boats disappearing within the Devil's Sea limits. Legend has it that dragons rise to the surface of the water to drag boats and their crew members into the deep sea bed. The men who first put forth the idea of the Bermuda Triangle, Charles Berlitz, is also who proposed the notion of the Devil's Sea in Japan. Berlitz labeled it the Dragon's Triangle in his book, The Dragon's Triangle, on the subject published in 1989. According to Berlitz, between 1952 and 1954, five Japanese military ships and 700 crewmen disappeared in this mysterious triangle. The Devil's Sea is part of the Philippine Sea. This follows an imaginary line that goes from Western Japan north of Tokyo, 
to the tip of the Pacific and returns east through the Agasawara Islands and Guam to Japan again. Like Bermuda, it also forms a similar type of triangular-shaped zone. Starting from western Japan, north of Tokyo, it follows a line to the point in the Pacific, which is about 145 degrees east latitude. Both are located at 35 degrees west latitude, respectively. The similarities do not end here. The two zones are in the eastern end of the mainland and stretched to the deepest parts of waters where the sea is driven by strong currents over active underwater volcanic areas. The Dragon's Triangle is an area of great seismic activity, with a seabed in which the transformation continues and some parts of the land emerged to 12,000 meters deep. Those islets and masses of land had emerged and disappeared before they could be drawn on maps. There are navigational letters and documents that included a few of those vanished lands in which many experienced sailors used to land in ancient times. It is said that the conqueror Kublai Khan, the fifth great Khan of the Mongol Empire and the grandson of Genghis Khan, had tried to make inroads into Japan in 1274 and 1281 AD. Khan attempted the invasions through a route that crossed the Devil Sea. He failed to invade the country after losing his vessels and 40,000 crew members abroad in this triangular area, reportedly due to typhoons. There were two typhoons that mysteriously protected the shores of Japan from the Mongol hordes. The Japanese legend conveys that kamikaze, or divine winds, were called upon by the Emperor of Japan. These winds turned into two dreadful storms over the Devil's Sea that sank a fleet of 900 Mongol ships carrying 40,000 soldiers. Then the devastated fleet had left from mainland China, and it was supposed to meet a southern fleet of 100,000 troops to overwhelm Japanese defenders. Instead, Kublai Khan's forces fought to a stalemate after 50 days, and the Japanese repelled the invaders when Khan's forces retreated and many soldiers deserted. The famous Japanese legend of Utsuro-bun, which literally means hollow ship in Japanese, refers to an unknown object that allegedly washed ashore in 1803 in Hitachi province on the eastern coast of Japan, close to Tokyo and the Dragon's Triangle. According to legend, an attractive young woman aged 18 to 20 years old arrived on a local beach aboard the hollow ship on February 22, 1803. Fishermen brought her inland to investigate further but the woman was unable to communicate in Japanese. She was very different from anyone there. The woman had red hair and eyebrows, and her hair was elongated by artificial white extensions. The extensions could have been made of white fur or thin, white powdered textile streaks. This hairstyle cannot be found in any literature. The skin of the lady was a very pale, pinkish color. She wore precious, long, and smooth clothes of unknown fabrics. Although the mysterious woman appeared friendly and courteous, she acted oddly. She always clutched a moderately sized 24-inch quadratic box made of pale material. She did not allow anyone to touch the box, no matter how kindly or pressingly the witnesses asked. Unable to communicate with one another nor gain any helpful information, the fishermen returned her and her vessel to the sea, where it drifted away. Many believe that she was an intelligent extraterrestrial being who had accidentally come to Earth from another world through her spaceship. That said, the credibility of the books containing accounts of the mystery woman have been questioned by many historians. 
though it has been verified that these books were written before 1844, well before the modern era of the UFO. For thousands of years, the inhabitants of the area have described the Dragon's Triangle as an extremely dangerous place because there have been several strange disappearances and bizarre events that are still unexplained. Among its victims, a long list of fishing boats, large warships, and aircrafts of all kinds simply disappeared with all their crew inside the evil triangle. Every time the last radio communications to which they are unanswered, one would think that it is spatiotemporal distensions and deviations of crew members' consciousness that prevent communication. It has been verified that the magnetic activity of the zone is also similar to the Bermuda Triangle, which is greater than any other place on Earth. However, no one has still been able to determine that this unusual magnetic activity is the actual cause of the disappearances or not. Departing from the magnetic theory, old folklore speaks of the dragons that appear from the depths to swallow a whole ship or even an island. Dragons that then return to the bottom of the sea without a trace. According to another Japanese legend, The Dragon's Triangle boasts the sea devil in its deepest part, where it has an ancient city frozen in time forever. People also claim to have witnessed phantom ships suddenly appear, as if they ascend from the depths to disappear after a while. The Dragon's Triangle became the center of the world's research and naval interests when warships, fishing boats, and aircrafts were all revoked from their regular route. Through the Devil's Sea Zone. In 1955, the Japanese government financed a research ship, the Kaio Maru 5, to study the Devil's Sea. The boat mysteriously disappeared with all of the scientists who were integrating the expedition, forcing the Japanese government to officially label the area as a dangerous zone. Besides all the unnatural deaths and disappearances, there are reports of UFO sightings and the mystical thick fog that looms large in this area of the Pacific, appearing and disappearing mysteriously. Just like the Bermuda Triangle, the activities of extraterrestrial vessels can be experienced there frequently. For the past few decades, people from all around the world Have been trying their best to explain the strange phenomena that have taken place for millennia. However, there are really some fascinating facts and theories about the Dragon's Triangle that you should know about. One theory tends to a strange connection between the magnetic poles of the two triangles, the Bermuda and the Dragon Triangle, that creates a spatio temporal duplicate of each other. Mystery lovers claim that the Bermuda and Dragon's Triangles are at the opposite side of each other, and that a straight line could be easily drawn between them through the center of the Earth. Even if it was true, it would not explain the dangers inherent in any of the zones. However, the reality is that there are mainly these two areas on Earth where huge ships and aircrafts. Inexplicably disappear with all its crew without leaving a trace or signs of life. Scientists specializing in different subjects, geologists, meteorologists, physicists, and astronomers, have proposed another explanation for the Dragon's Triangle mysteries. According to them, there are 12 zones of great geomagnetic disturbances on the planet. Two of them are the North and South Poles, and five of the remaining ten are closely linked to the Dragon Triangle Zone. That's how the place shows such unusual geomagnetic disturbances. These disturbances distract aircrafts and ships. Another truly engrossing, cutting edge hypothesis comes from the existence of the parallel universe. According to this theory, 
there is indeed a huge vortex in the Dragon's Triangle, or any such other spots, that opens on another world, a parallel world consisting of antimatter, which absorbs people, masses, or even light and time. At the origin of the universe, the matter was not alone to appear. Antimatter accompanied it in equal quantities. Thus, matter and antimatter separately formed two distinct universes a universe of matter and a universe of antimatter. These two universes coexist within the same space, but not within the same time. Time separates them. It is this temporal difference that forms a barrier between them and prevents them from mixing. If this were not the case, matter and antimatter would totally destroy themselves in contact with each other. This separation is therefore essential. These universes have evolved at the same pace in the same stages. And have both populated the same galaxies composed of stars and planets. Though these galaxies are not distributed differently in space from one universe to another. In other words, galaxies and anti galaxies occupy different places in space. Each star and planet in each matter universe galaxy has a twin in another anti matter universe galaxy. Our world is no exception. The Earth has a twin, Earth of antimatter, called the Dark Twin, an anti Earth that vibrates at a frequency higher than that of the Earth, because it is more evolved than it. Each star and planet in the universe of matter are connected to their antimatter twin by an energy bridge, a magnetic vortex. Among the various hypotheses put forward, the most plausible is the Atlantean hypothesis. Indeed, the destruction of Poseidia, the largest and the last of the seven islands that formed Atlantis, left at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, a giant crystal emitting powerful electromagnetic radiation that fed the Atlanteans with energy. It would be this huge crystal. Always active, that would disturb the magnetic vortex connecting the Earth to its twin antimatter. Its hyper powerful radiation would cross the Earth from side to side and connect the Bermuda Triangle to the Dragon's Triangle in a huge energy loop, whose radium fluctuations would occasionally open a vortex, the spatial temporal door to the Earth's dark twin. In 1986, while looking for a suitable place to observe the sharks, Kiachiro Aratake, a director of Yunagunicho Tourism Association, noticed some singular seabed formations resembling architectural structures. The strange structures are now widely known as Yonogune Monument or the Yonogune Submarine Ruins. It is a submerged rock formation off the coast of Yonoguni Island, the southernmost of the Ryukyu Islands in Japan. It lies approximately 100 kilometers east of Taiwan. To make things even stranger, the Yonoguni Monument is situated within the Devil Sea Triangle, that has led many to believe that the underwater structures are the remains of the lost city of Atlantis. It is true that, with this one single video, we can't draw a proper conclusion to all those strange things that have been occurring in the Devil's Sea for more than a thousand years. The truth is that it's still unknown to us what really happens in the Devil's Sea. Scientists have concluded all these oddities, saying that the disappearances are due to the fact that this place has intense magnetic alterations. Which cause aircrafts and ships to become disoriented when entering the triangle. However, what really happens there is still an unsolved mystery.